Hello, my name is Henry Silverman, and in this presentation, I would like to discuss the justification of health promotion activities. As discussed previously, the defining dilemma in public health is how to balance the duty to enhance the public health against individual rights and liberties. For example, what limits on liberty are justified to enhance the public health? An example of this would be water fluoridation. Or what limits on choice or autonomy are justified to enhance the public health? An example of this we have seen would be helmet laws. And finally, what limits on privacy and confidentiality are justified to enhance the public health? An example of this would be surveillance programs. This slide shows potential justification schemes for a specific public health action. For example, we use harms to others to justify programs that would prohibit smoking and texting while driving. Alternatively, we would use the concept of increased social economic harms or costs that would justify programs that would mandate the wearing of helmets and seat belts and the prohibition of fatty foods. However, these two lines of justification or this broad aspect of the harm principle begs the question, in a highly integrated society, what action does anyone take that does not ultimately have an impact on society? And finally, we need to confront and justify public health actions that are aimed to promote individual health. The other way to ask this question is to ask whether Mill's harm principle is applicable to actions that largely promote individual health. As you recall, Mill's principle is as follows. The only purpose for which power can be rightly exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. The two most pivotal words in this quotation includes the following, against his will and to prevent harm to others. The essence is how to define will and how to define harm. Regarding the latter, we have seen that harms can include physical harms from the effects of smoking or economic harms from the effects of not wearing a helmet. Regarding the word will, how we define the concept of will will lead us to determine when public health actions are in accordance with Mill's harm principle. That is, how much of a will does a person need to have for us to say that we are interfering with their will? I say this because Mill thought that it was appropriate to interfere with individuals for their own sake if they lack sufficient will. Let me explain further. This slide shows the different types of individual actions based on the voluntariness of their actions and their effects on others. Voluntariness is equivalent to Mill's will. That is, someone acting with sufficient voluntariness is acting with sufficient will or sufficient autonomy. From this table, we see that if an individual actions have what we call other regarding effects, then we are in box two and four. And in these instances, public health actions might be justifiable because they have other regarding effects. Regarding box three, if an action solely has self-regarding actions but is non-voluntary, then Mill thought that it would be appropriate to interfere with that action. This would be labeled soft paternalism. However, if someone's action is solely self-regarding but is considered voluntary, Mill did not think that it would be appropriate to interfere with that person's action, and this would be called hard paternalism. To summarize, Mill would contend that hard paternalism would not be a justification for public health actions. Examples of hard paternalism would include imposition of limit, limitations on, on choice or interference with liberty for his or her own good. 
But Mill would agree that actions that represent soft paternalism could be justified, and that would include acting for children or individuals with cognitive limitations. While soft paternalism is justifiable, according to Mill, the issue is how do you justify acts, public health acts, that largely represent hard paternalism? And this is going to be the focus of this presentation. Before we take on this issue of hard paternalism, let's provide more details on when we think we are dealing with soft paternalism. In theory, soft paternalism occurs when the person being interfered with is not acting with enough knowledge or without substantial voluntariness. This would include someone acting with limited information, making errors or miscalculations based on the facts, uh, a person having limited willpower to make the choices that they would ordinarily make for themselves, or someone having undue optimism, or just mainly focusing on short-term goals without looking at the long-term outcomes. In these instances, when someone is not operating with enough knowledge or substantial voluntariness, then one might have a duty to protect individuals from non-voluntary choices. Let's uh, take a look at these ideas and apply them to the obesity epidemic. Many commentators believe that many public health actions to control the obesity epidemic represent soft paternalism, as there is a concern that even when information is widely available, uh, con consumers may misapprehend the risks, personal behavior may be heavily influenced by broad social and institutional forces and not simply a matter of free will, or the question might be, are behaviors a consequence of choice, that is free will, or are they socially embedded? For example, how much of our actions are influenced by peer pressure? There may also be misleading advertising, or there may be the concept of the so-called food addiction. In, in the, in, indeed, these two last aspects are due to attempts by the food industry to mislead the public with improper food label, labeling, or they uh, try to addict us with, um, with the, with the non-healthy foods. And actually, uh, this is not a conspiracy theory, but there is this concept of the extraordinary science of addictive junk food, where the food industry spends billions of dollars looking at the science of how to make taste addictive. In fact, uh, there was an interesting article written, How to Force Ethics on the Food Industry. So based on these concepts, there is a concern that people are not acting substantially voluntariness and actions to promote healthy behavior may actually represent soft paternalism. That said, while many actions to control the obesity epidemic may not be hard paternalistic, as shown in these slides under the categories of facilitative actions and mixed actions. Many do believe that several measures to control the obesity epidemic represent coercive or paternalistic actions such as prohibitions on certain foods and taxation. People against actions that represent hard paternalism believe that individuals are self-interested and are most informed about their own needs and hence they should decide for themselves, even if they make unhealthy choices. Essentially, the concept is that one should not promote actions that represent hard paternalism. And in fact, in this one article by David Resnick, entitled Trans Fat Bans in Human Freedom, David Resnick says, although these policies 
may have a positive impact on human health. They open the door to excessive government control over food, which could restrict dietary choices, interfere with cultural, eth ethnic, and religious traditions, and exacerbate social economic inequalities. He further says, to protect human freedom and other values, policies that significantly restrict food choices should be adopted only when they are supported by substantial scientific evidence and when policies that impose fewer restrictions on freedom, such as educational campaigns and product labeling, are likely to be ineffective. So what would be one way to justify hard paternalistic acts? Well, one way is to try to balance the extent of the harms to self and to society versus the, the uh, degree of the intrusion on autonomy interests. So we have four different types of categories. On one hand, we could have an action that could prevent small harms, but has a moderate or high intrusion on autonomy, or an action has the potential to prevent great harms, but have a moderate or high intrusion on autonomy. Alternatively, an action could be preventing small harms and also have a low intrusion on autonomy interests, or an action could have great harms or an action has a potential to prevent great harms to self and society, but have a low intrusion on autonomy interests. So, for example, seatbelt laws and helmet laws could be considered an action that could prevent potentially great harms to self and society, and yet have a low intrusion on autonomy. An action that could prevent great harms but have a low intrusion on autonomy would be considered justification for a hard paternalistic action. Similarly, depending on the type of action uh, that could promote healthy living may be considered as preventing great harms to self and society but have a low autonomy interest, such as food labeling. Um, and this would also justify that paternalistic action. This slide shows the necessary requirement to justify a hard paternalistic liberty limitation. And this would include the following. The objective of the hard paternalistic liberty limitation is to protect the subject from significant harms. The subject has to have a low autonomy interest in the action. The paternalistic action is imposed only where no morally preferable, less autonomy restrictive alternatives are available. And the paternalistic action has a high probability of success or effectiveness. So now we come to the summary slide. Now we come to the summary slide regarding justifications to limit self-regarding harms. This would include if the action has harms to society, or we could invoke a broad concept of the harm principle that would include an increase in social economic cost. Of course, these two latter categories would mean that the action has self-regarding harms and other regarding harms. Now, if an action has only self-regarding harms, one could justify the action based on soft paternalism, where we want to protect individuals from their bad choices, also thinking that these choices are impaired in some sense, either from lack of information, lack of willpower, or the fact that uh, individuals are operating on the social determinants of health that are not under the control of the individual. Or we could admit that the action does represent hard paternalism, and we try to justify the hard paternalism 
and Nancy Cask in her article tries to justify hard paternalism. Or we could say that the hard paternalistic act will lead to enhanced human freedom or the so-called freedom to approach. And this is mentioned in the articles um, by Buchanan and Teglin. Or we could justify hard paternalism by invoking a communitarian type of concept or a freedom through concept. This communitarian aspect is shown in this slide as a justification for limits on self-regarding actions, or again, a justification for hard paternalism. The concept, as explained by Dan Beecham in his article, goes as follows. One should have a concern for the common good that transcends private individual interests. One should have an interest in the good and the welfare of the commonwealth, and hence, and hence the concept is that the regulatory power is to protect not so much individual citizens from their unhealthy behaviors, but rather one should con consider these citizens as part of a group. And hence, public health paternalism is aimed at the group as opposed to personal paternalism. So regarding seatbelt laws, instead of thinking the life you save might be your own, rather we should think that the lives we save together as a community might include your own. This would be the communitarian aspect to justify hard paternalism. This is, again, just a short snapshot in how we could justify hard paternalistic acts that are directed mainly at self-regarding actions. Thank you very much.